Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Yahazek Reacts. New, very Tassian video, how NASA reinvented the wheel. Uh, we reacted to one of his videos before. It was absolutely great. Uh, you can find it on my channel if you scroll for a little bit. This I just start watching. About as close I, 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 I normally do like a bit of an intro or an explanation. I, I This this was made 27 minutes ago, guys. We, we, we're we one of the first people to watch it. Let's magic just see it. It is possible to find in nature. I just don't get it. Wait, what? This, this metal is about as close to magic as it is possible to find in nature. What I just don't fuck? get it. It can adjust its arrangement of atoms to return. What the fuck? Get. It can that is its arrangement. Is that 5k G it's raising? To return to some predefined shape, but it also converts between mechanical. Uh, so it uh, that happens from temperature, and thermal energy, and it can stretch up to 30 Wait, times. Wait, okay, so just just how you can heat it up for it to do a movement you can also move it and it and heats up a ton. also i love the iphone camera i love the iphone thermal adapter attachment thing that's 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 so cool this is not an ad read or anything i'm just saying mechanical and thermal energy and it can stretch up to 30 times more than an ordinary metal and still spring back to its original size okay so oh my god i can imagine the wheel made from this material being super cool oh that's so in interesting my hand shrinking back because of these unique properties it's holy being used in everything shit from medical device i hope he explains how it's made because this is so interesting devices to toys to bulletproof bike tires what the fuck? and it's allowing nasa to reinvent the wheel just started streaming <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Hello, I'm back. Okay, we're not live streaming anymore. Well, yeah, I want to go back. That was crazy. To toys, to bulletproof bike tires. <sighs> what the fuck? Here we go. And it's allowing NASA to reinvent the wheel for space exploration. Oh, I love that wheel tester machine. This oh, man, that thing is so cool. The, the bones of the tire. Uh, this the one bones looks... of the tire is a slinky. So basically, this is the the slinky applied to the rim. You just wrap the slinky around a rim. Yeah, it doesn't get any simpler than that, right? Here is a. a and then you just put some fucking material over it, like a cover. Slinkies inside a polymer. If you look inside there. The polymer, yeah. This tire does not require air pressure to work. Yeah, of course, because it's it's being held up by the by the metal. That's so the so like yeah. If it pops, like who cares? Sure, and shock absorption are all provided by that metal slinky. And all the plastic uh, on the outer edge needs to do is hold the general shape of the tire together, so that the fucking springs don't go all over the place. So like a couple punctures won't do shit to it. That's like around a hundred psi, or what a. No that's a oh my god! That's act. That's the perfect. That's literally the pressure I pump my bike tires to when it's not raining. Normal road bike would feel like. Yeah. Yeah, a normal road bike, exactly. Oh, guys, you can you can see right there in the in the frame, right here. That holy shit! Oh, I'm so hyped because right now the best we got is tubeless tires, but they're not too common on road bikes, or at least mine doesn't have one. Which means. Oh shit! I sk skipped an idea. That is, this is so hype. I'm, I, I, oh, you have no idea how hyped I am. I must have hit some. Holy nails. shit. Imagine not having to worry about your tires popping when you go out on like a four, four hour journey. I don't feel anything different. Ops. This Fuck. Is, okay, I want to watch this again. Another, another flat tire. No pneumatic tire. It would feel like. Yeah. Require air pressure to work. The structure and shock. Of or what a normal road bike would feel like. Yeah. Which means you should be Fuck. able to puncture it with no loss of performance. That is insane. So we're drive it over a bed of nails. But first, we'll test a traditional pneumatic tire just to make sure these nails are sharp. Yep, I'm hearing it. The tires are fucked up. By the way, I love when uh, sound design artists, whatever you call them, I don't actually know the term, add the sound effects for slow mo footage. It. It always sounds not quite real, but it's like, it's just cool. Immersive, I think would be a good another word. Another puncture, another flat tire. <laughs> this one kind of expected. So now I'm going to put these airless tires to the test, uh, driving over the same. Airless, I mean, when I when people talk about tires that like are fine, it, they think tubeless. Tubeless, by the way, for, for those guys that didn't know, I, I didn't explain it. They, uh, they instead of having an inner tube, which you fill up with air, uh, they, they 
are just that you fill the tire itself up with air and it will have uh, a liquid inside which if a tire ends up getting punctured the liquid from the air pressure from inside the tire will push the liquid towards the hole and then the moment it comes in contact with the air it'll, it'll harden and so uh, uh, the punctures will kind of auto seal and now granted that does mean you have to replace the liquid every so often and whatnot and it's 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 still way less effort than it's still way less management than having action to like uh, deal with an actual pop tire i'll tell you that much but it is it is still a little bit of work now compared to this this is fucking insane Better if it actually nails So like yeah, the 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 outer shell popped. I heard a lot of pops. I must have hit some nails. I don't feel anything different. Yeah, it's popping. And it's fu man, that's fucking insane. That would make me feel so much safer on the like going out long distance. Still rides well. Cause like I don't want to. Cause like you know, given the choice, I'd rather not have to carry around a backpack with. Just empty fucking tubes and a, an extra pump with me and and what and whatnot. Like, get up some speed. That's not what that's not what you want to spend your time doing. That's definitely a nail. Like the nail broke in it. Why is it? That's what it looks like. Yeah, the nail's in the tire. We're now gonna Holy try to shoot, shoot a bullet. In and I bet it'd be easy to fucking fit. Like, oh no, the tire popped. Okay, let me peel off the uh, the outer layer. Like, if the tire's Let's say you, you got it popped so many times, you decided to drive around on nails yourself for some reason, like you're a psycho, right? You don't value your 200, like $2,000 bike wheels. Okay, no problem. Just take the outer shell off, slap a new one on. Now it's perfectly functional again, and you didn't have to replace literally anything else. And even in case of a really bad like poppage, right? Let's say, like your your wheel gets fucked up like often if you're going fast that means the wheel itself will get damaged because you like end up scrubbing it or whatever like if if if, if it, you give it enough time after the tire pops uh but here no it's it's literally fine into the tire and like, see it what just doesn't matter three two one is that a fucking musket <laughs> time travel Look at that! <laughs> wow. It's just, it's a really clean shot straight through. Yep. Barely even see the mark. And obviously it's fine because, I mean, what did you do? You just slightly damaged the shell. Like, it doesn't Looks matter. Like this one actually hit the... Hit the... Uh, Alloy? Yep. It does to me. Yeah, that's what it feels like. You can see we spliced off some of the bullet before we even got to the cardboard. How's it ride? Yeah, no problems. Bulletproof bicycle. Fucking this insane. bulletproof bike tire actually comes out of NASA's research into making wheels for space. So this, this I actually heard of uh, from uh, just a different video on YouTube years ago, but it was it was still in development. It really wasn't like for, for, so at the, at the time I was watching this, it, this was basically just concept missions stuff. It is really hard to make good wheels for other planets. I mean, a lot of the places- Yeah, because how the fuck are you gonna test them out? And rovers to, there is no or very low atmospheric pressure. We yeah. can't use rubber pneumatic tires because- of And so it just, whatever we've been developing for like a hundred, yeah, because you can't technically test them out, you know, make low gravity zone, zones or whatever. I'm sure the, the pe people make shit. I'm sure some humans could manage to come up with a system where you can test tires. I, I'm not, I, I don't know enough about that too tell you how it's done obviously but i'm sure it's possible the real problem is that this t normal tire technology or the wheel technology that we've been in uh, perfecting for years and years just straight up does not operate in the same way and so you have to go start from scratch to to to, to build something that would work on another planet and that led to tires that are unbreakable bro i cannot wait for that to hit the market the general market that'll be so fucking the sick conditions on the moon and mars there's no confining pressure outside of it it can basically explode Besides, with temperatures dropping, yeah, yeah, of course, that, that makes low, sense as well. Those rubber becomes brittle. If this were a, a flagpole, the temperature facing the sun would be 250 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, the rubber likes being <laughs> at 121. Zero, shadow is 250 degrees below zero. Let's yeah, no, no, that's that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Negative 90 is the glass transition temperature. It's when the polymer goes from being flexible to a rigid element. 
This is what happens when you dip rubber in liquid nitrogen. Which is noticeably colder than the surface of the moon, but wait, is it? Let's check. Yeah, it's noticeably, it's like 40 degrees colder. But, you know, same thing. Yeah, it just becomes fucking brittle and useless as, as a wheel. But you can't send <laughs> rubber to the moon. Yep. This is why almost all the wheels used for exploring other planets have been made of hard metal. This is actually oh, a I had no spare idea. for the Curiosity rover. It's made out of aluminum, a single billet. Bro, so is it 3D printed aluminum? That actually looks like plastic. Down so you don't have to worry about fasteners or welds. That's or so well made. Like I mean, no shit. It's a fucking rover being sent to space, but still. Be a, a failure point. But with it being so expensive to launch matter into space, the wheels have to be as lightweight as possible. It's, it's light-ish, but it's still heavy. To meet those mass limitations, they made this skin 0.7 millimeters thick. Thinner than a credit card. Yep. What the fuck? These structural members here, which we also call grousers, they're there to give the wheel strength, but also help grab onto obstacles. And that is insane. That's so thin. That because this rubber is so large and heavy. The less than a millimeter. And really? The is just so aggressive and nasty. They're actually seeing much higher peak loads kind of focused on areas between these grousers than what was predicted. And this is the actual condition of the wheels on Mars right now. And as you can see, got big holes and cracks. Yeah, the it's, skin, it's destroyed. The now the wheel still operates, hasn't immobilized the rover. It's still going to complete its Yeah, mission. that makes sense. A couple holes in a rigid wheel probably wouldn't destroy it completely. But, but uh, you it know, it's going to de deteriorate over time even harder to a point where it actually does become inoperable. Exact where it can go and how, how efficient it is. When you apply a force to a material, that is known as a stress. Mm -hmm. And what you're really doing is tugging on all the atoms inside the object. And as a result, their spacing changes a little Stretching bit, and so the material okay. deforms. For example, if you pull on an object, it will get slightly longer. And the yes. per unit change in length is called strain. Now, for most materials under low stresses, strain is directly proportional to the stress applied. I mean, the more you stress it, the more it stretches. And the material is elastic. If you remove the stress, the object goes back to its original size. So no atoms have moved around and no bonds. And so move. the more elastic, the higher level the strain can be before it uh, deforms permanently. Deformed, you've just made them flex when you apply that stress. But if the stress, oh, stress applied exceeds the yield strength of the material, well, then the strain is so great that the atoms can't maintain their positions relative to each other. Defects called edge dislocations can move through the material. The atoms are actually... All right, and that's how shit gets damaged if you tug on it too hard. Themselves, and so the deformation is not reversible. It's plastic deformation. Okay, I see. So the object won't go back to its original shape when the stress is removed. If enough stress is applied, the material can completely fracture. Mm -hmm. In the worst case scenario, this results in holes like in the Mars rover wheels, which reduce their performance and ultimately could jeopardize the mission. Yep. Ordinary metals can withstand a strain of only around 0.3 to 0.8% elastically. It looks like more than that from the amount you can just stretch a spring, but I guess not. Any more than that, and they undergo plastic yep. deformation. Yep. So they won't return to their original shape. Ultimately, they so that material is definitely extremely unique. We, I get that. I just want to see how how. Well, what what's right. what's different about it? Kinked it and stretched it. And that's why every component of a space vehicle is designed never to stretch more than that 0.3 to 0.8 percent. But that's a significant limitation. There is a different type of wheel that NASA has tried in space, which are those on the Apollo Lunar Roving Vehicle, or LRV. That particular structure that they built is something that we call a panograph. All okay. it is is it's a set of wires that have been over, under, over, under woven. And this, this on the surface here, oh, that, I mean, that was grip, sick. also to strengthen. <laughs> it's primarily to ensure that the tire does not sink into the ground. So they did. Oh, I see. Because yeah, if it's if if it's just a mesh surface and it's going on sand or you know a sand a sand like substance, I could 100% see it just phasing into the fucking floor, and that would be the dumbest way to lose your space uh, rover. Use tread strips <laughs> to figure out how much coverage they needed. And so they, they found out that roughly 50% was enough to keep the tire kind of floating on the surface and still uh, maintain okay, that, that makes sense. 
The lunar roving vehicle wheels worked well for the short distance journeys traveled on the moon. I mean, the farthest this vehicle ever went was 36 kilometers. Still quite far. But still, these wheels needed to be designed to minimize plastic deformation of the steel mesh. Yeah, it makes sense. So they put this internal structure inside there. We call it a bump stop. So as they hit a bump, and this is deformed. So there's, it, it can all, so there's a hard limit on how much it can deform. When it hits that, it stops the deformation. Because I'm assuming they fucking calculated uh, exactly like... If it deforms more than that, it'll be permanent. And if it's just under that, it's fine. To keep it just below that yep. proportional yeah, okay, limit okay. where they would induce plasticity. This wheel was good enough for the short Apollo missions, but for long- So is that metal that uh, we talked about, that he talked about at the start of the video, just kind of a, nor a normal metal, but with a way, way higher cap uh, b before it gets permanent deformation? Well, no, 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 it's probably something different because we saw when he heated the metal, it went back to its original shape and also it released thermal energy uh, when pressure was applied to it. So, not pressure, uh, what, what, what do you call that? I, I really don't remember the, the word he used for it, so I'm just going to say pressure, but that's not what he said. Longer journeys, a bump stop won't be enough to prevent plastic deformation building up over time. Okay. Mesh steel wheels have been tried on Earth but their performance does degrade over time. This was the Mars steel spring tire. We right, made okay, so machine. it's not, Test yeah. Reagan. There's no fracture, but you see a lot of permanent deformation there. What we need is a material that is strong and durable like steel, but which can endure much more strain without deforming. And that's where the one from the start of the video comes in. And that is where this stuff comes in. Yes. Bro, even Amen. the way I phrase my set, I'm, I, I'm becoming a smart person, what the hell? This reaction channel is really racking up my IQ, bro. In sixty-one, the Naval Ordnance Laboratory was doing experiments with different alloys involving nickel and titanium. A sample that had been repeatedly worked, heated, and cooled was shown to one of the associate technical directors, who just happened to be a pipe smoker. So he decided to see what the sample would do if he applied a bit of heat from his lighter. And when he did that, he found that the material changed shape. It's like, this okay. shocked everyone <laughs> and led to more investigations into the material, which became known as nitinol for its components, nickel and titanium, and for the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, where- Nickel and titanium, okay. I think those two materials are not like extra not super exotic right no that that sounds feasible that sounds like something that could go into mass production eventually not maybe like for uh, i'm just I'm, I'm just hoping that i get bike wheels with uh, i just hope i get unbreakable bike wheels guys that that's all i'm thinking it was discovered so why did nitinol change shape well, it's really because the alloy can undergo a phase change in the solid state in heated nitinol, uh, okay. the atoms are arranged in a cubic lattice arrangement and this phase is known as... That was the kind of okay I say when I really don't understand what he means, so I'm waiting for an explanation. But upon cooling, the atoms ease into a form known as twin austenite. But upon cooling, the atoms ease into a form known as twinned martensite. Uh, okay, I'm not going to remember those names. I hope it's not important. <laughs> it's a messier, lower symmetry arrangement of the atoms. Okay. And in this phase, you can apply stress to the material and deform it. But unlike in an ordinary metal, this deformation is not causing bonds between atoms to break. And Do we know why? Dislocations moving throughout the material. Because like, I, I, I get that it's different, but I want to know why. In this case, the crystal structure is changing once again to a detwinned form of martensite. And now when you heat it back up, the material goes from martensite back to being austenite. Which means all the atoms go back to their original locations, and so the material returns to its original shape. We can basically... Oh, but why? I don't understand. Guys, do we have any, like, scientists in chat? Or in chat? I'm not even, I don't even live stream. I don't know why I said chat. I literally, like, last time I live streamed, it was like five years ago. Do we have any any smart people in the comments? Can uh, I, I'm I'm hoping the video explains it further, but if it doesn't, you know, if we can have some smart people in the comments, very simply explain we it. That that'd be set fucking sick. This shape as the parent known memory shape. That's why we call it shape memory. Yeah, we can makes stretch sense. this out. I could, if I cooled it down, I could stretch it out even more. But as soon as I heat it back up, it'll remember that original. Parent that is shape. so quick as well. It instantly came back. And that's why nitinol is considered a shape memory alloy. You know what that made me think, right? He said the thing gets heated up when it gets bent. So here's the question. 
Will the heat of it being bent be enough for it to go bring its itself back into shape? In which case, you won't even have to reheat the wheels or anything for them to go to their initial state. The shape is set at high temperature when the material is in the austenite phase. Then, as the material is cooled down, it undergoes a phase transition into twinned martensite. Yes. If stress is now applied to the material in this phase, it can be extensively deformed by changing the crystal structure into detwinned martensite. So it's even harder twinned. <laughs> when the stress is released, most of that deformation remains. But when the sample is okay. heated, the atoms return to the austenite phase, which returns the material to its original shape. <laughs> that is so fucking insane. It's like you're barely in the water. No, and it's it just... as fast as you can conduct heat to it or get heat away from it. Whoa, whoa. I mean, that's cool. Like, that is this that is actually wild. Like I would have thought it's a very slow process because it actually looked like a time lapse when I first saw him like bl bl putting the torch close to it. This shit is insane. Oh, this can be used for so much more than just the wheel. Although I think the wheel really is, is what needs to happen first. Night all that most people are aware of, and one that makes it useful for a lot of applications. So that's a stint. They you can see like the pe this guy, the cameraman, he's like, yeah, this shit is cool. He knows. And it makes it useful for a lot of applications. So that's a stint. They slightly cool these down right below to martensite, and then they crush it or elongate it. So you can see it gets real thin. And then they put in a catheter, and that catheter goes through the body to the place where they want to deploy the stent. And then upon deploying it, it bounces right back, increasing that outer diameter and opening that artery. Nitinol is absolutely perfect for that. Shape memory alloys can actually generate- So, works for medicine as well. Significant forces. Surgery or whatever. Heated, which means they can also be used as- Doctor stuff. You're gonna see a huge amount of force and stress build up in the wire, which we can see with here, which how much it's pulling. Great, I love these things. Six pounds, seven. You can really see it contract in there. 13, 15, 16, 17, 20 pounds. Oh, what the hell? In. That's about That's... 90 newtons of force. Can we get kg? Scientists have. All right, let's 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 convert that. 90 newtons to kg. Nine kilograms shape memory alloys to fracture a rock what the fuck shape memory alloys are being investigated for use in aviation i made a video How so? before about vortex generators which are these little fins that stick up out of the wing of a plane to trip the airflow into turbulence okay i actually want to see this video as well that's interesting what the fuck this is important for takeoff and landing to keep the flow attached to the wings so you don't stall but when you're up at cruise and you don't need, need those vortices being generated, you want these to stow because they're a drag penalty. As the plane just climbs from takeoff to cruise, we go from some temperature on the ground to something close to minus 50, minus 60 C at cruise. The and you can have the temperature change automatically. Oh my God, that's so cool. We can just take advantage of so from the temperature changing, it will automatically literally fully automatic and free it doesn't cost you like once you manufacture it once you don't have to use anything to make them operate you don't have to connect wiring through that part of the wing specifically it's that's so much better than having to like mechanically do it happens in the environment when we cool this one down no controller no operator it autonomously stays flat the temperature at which that the is so smart between austenite and martensite can be tuned to be anywhere between minus 150 to... Oh, so you manually choose the temperatures as well. Okay, that's what I was actually curious about. This says minus 150, not 50. Positive 350 degrees Celsius. This is done by changing the ratio of the elements and using different heat treatments. And then as that would heat back up, coming into landing. That is so fucking cool right back up this principle has been extended to operate the main flaps on an aircraft now the heating and cooling is not passive but controlled by a heating element 
Okay, uh, I wonder why you do that over using like pistons. So we've done demonstrations where you have a 737 aircraft and no hydraulic actuators on the wing. Hydraulic the, box. Yeah. All we have is a shuttle mechanism that's driven by two tubes and nitinol. And we've driven those ailerons and flap elements on the wing box of a 737 in flight, 60 degrees flap angle down, 30 degrees flap angle up, just by heating and cooling. That is so much... Uh strength in, in in just the metal expanding and contracting that's crazy or well no not quite expanding and contracting right it's moving but places all you know what i mean dogs. the shape memory effect is the main thing people know about materials like nitinol but they have another unique property which makes them ideal Give it to for me. making durable wheels. i want to know and you're just going to take it and you're going to loop it a couple of times around your hand like that and you're just going to pull on that wire and feel six to eight percent strain in a piece of metal Oh, that's really weird. The that's metal is stretchy. Percent. What the fuck? Strain, which you can't do in other wires, right? That is so bizarre. I mean, you guys probably can't see it because if if I can barely see it in the video, and you have a second layer of compression through mine. But what's weird about it oh. is that it feels a little crunchy. It it, it feels because you're feeling all of the reorientations. Oh, so weird. So that is cool, though, right? That yes, I've never seen cool. this shit before. That is bizarre. Can you hear that? Yeah. How so that, weird that is that? Ping Sounds is pretty 20. cool. Shape memory alloys can stretch up to 8% of their length and still spring back to their original size. This property <laughs> is known as super elasticity or pseudo elasticity. Holy shit. They're kind of misnomers because the material is not actually operating in its elastic regime. What's actually happening is that this nitinol is in the austenite phase. Its transition temperature is lower than room temperature. But by applying a stress, even with no temperature change, you can force the crystal structure to change from austenite into detwinned martensite. And this rearrangement uh, allows guys, the Guys, my brain can't comprehend these fucking words. You think I actually remember any of this shit? form by that 8%. And still, it'll snap back to its original configuration. Oh, because it's 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 temperature uh, it's temperature of being changed is just always outside of the range of what it touches. Once the stress is removed, of being permanently changed, atoms not not permanently like of, of being deformed to the austenite phase and holding in shape. That that's what I meant. I, I just don't know how to pr put it properly without uh, completely like s saying the wrong thing. That sound you're hearing is the material undergoing a stress-induced phase change in the solid state. That sound we hear is metals being stretched and then going back into position. That's if fucking you crazy. Think about it on a stress strain curve, now this transformation is occurring entirely. So as opposed to other metals, which after doing enough of those movements will eventually get fucked over. This is just fine to keep going and going. Really above the martensite transition temperature. Right, or is there a limit? I, I wonder if there's a limit to how many times it can flex before it starts deforming. So the material starts- Not deforming, what's even the word to use? Fuck, ah, it's so hard to talk about this without like using the wrong terminology. It's off but I think you guys know what I mean. Austenite phase. And then the applied stress is what induces the phase change from austenite to detwinned martensite. And when that stress is removed, the atoms spring back to the austenite phase, and so the material goes back to its original size and shape. If this were a normal tube, I would bend it to here and it would plasticize. If it was a brass yes. tube, which you know has a plastic buckling mode, it would go like this and it would actually buckle the wall. I would what never take my hands and bend them like this and have it completely return to shape. At the bend, the nitinol is transforming that from is austenite bizarre. to martensite and back. Oh, when we go fuck? from the higher symmetry phase, the austenite. And all you need to do to have this metal act like this is just change its, its default the temperature of going through these phases, which I don't remember what they're called, so I'm just not gonna even try. Uh, and uh, okay, so one thing I don't understand is how, like he said that it's like through temperature treatment that they change the default, that the, the, they change the temperatures at which the metal has different properties. But I, w I wonder what the actual process of the he of the treatment is. Symmetry daughter phase. Maybe, maybe it's not that interesting. That's why maybe he's not talking about it. Which one is it? Exothermic or endothermic? I feel like that should be 
exothermic. Good job, science guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to put your hand around this tube, you'll actually feel the heat energy, the enthalpy of that transformation evolving as heat. You ready? Yep. Oh yeah. Okay, so my previous idea of if it, if it would release heat from, uh, and, and that heat would return into its original state, that, that was that was stupid from the start because it releases heat from the transformation happening, not like the, it, it couldn't work the other way around. Okay, good to know. I bet some people have already disliked the video for that though. Real hot. <laughs> for my stupid ass idea. Ooh, hey, ooh, that is what it is. That, that actually is like burning. Like I can't keep my hand no, on it. No, keep your hand on it. It Jeez, won't burn. That's hot. When the stress is removed and the material goes back to being austenite, that phase change is endothermic. It absorbs heat. Okay, that makes sense. I was really curious, like, there is no way it just, I mean, that would just be a fucking infinite energy generation, right? Work in 2023, not, not a scam. So, so that's how it gains it back, right? When it goes to its initial state, it actually absorbs it instead. And I'm assuming it just has a limit of how much it's going to put out and absorb. <laughs> right? It's like you could use that, that is for so cool. So the, it's exactly right. So another area where these materials are being applied is in a field called elastocalorics. Is that what he, he said? Use that for refrigerator. So the yeah, yeah, okay. That's exactly right. So another area where these materials are being applied is in a field called elastocalorics, where we use this transformation to do things like equivalent to heat pumping. I want to shoot this with our thermal camera. We got a FLIR with us. How's that? This dissipation potential can act a little bit like and then it gets super the shock cold. absorber, right? So the tire itself could That's actually perform some of that dissipation potential on its own. It almost acts as a damper. Right. To that is that so cool, loss. man. So then your, your tire actually has a potential of becoming a complete suspension system, hmm. which obviously really simplifies building vehicles for, for space. The original tire, when I put load on it, okay, you can see I'm only transferring a load from the footprint to this little section yes. of the tire. That makes right? sense. By tying these, this bump stop element to here, when I go through a footprint, you can see now I'm transferring load 360 degrees around that the tire. That is so smart. Jesus, right? I mean, I shouldn't be surprised that this stuff is smart. These are NASA, Na NASA, NASA engineers we're talking about, but still, that is crazy. By doing that, I have now increased my load carrying capacity significantly without adding any more mass. Whoa. <laughs> so to make a tire out of shape memory alloy, they weave nitinol springs together into a mesh. It's a pretty tedious and time consuming process. So you're gonna take it like so. Do they have yes. to manually do it? You're gonna grab <laughs> that is rough. <laughs> Both ends. No. And now take no, it. No, you're I'll not. Take it yeah. And screw it in. Oh my goodness. Are you kidding me? Do they actually Is do this, this what manually? you do every day? 684 times. That is rough, because if you like move it around too much, I'm guessing you can accidentally fucking have the thing twirl into the wrong part and then the wheel gets all fucked up and it's less rigid uh, or and then it's less structurally, structural integrity of it is gonna be worse. 684 times <laughs> per time. time. Per tire. Will these wheels uh. work on rovers on the moon and Mars? Will they test the wheels extensively on a rotating carousel of different terrain types, from sand to small rocks to bigger rocks? So the terrain endurance rig basically consists of a circular carousel. That, that is, is cool. independently driven. That looks the cool. I've seen people build similar things out of Lego, by the way, which is fun. Wheel tire assembly is also independently driven, so we can create a forced slip condition, so we can drive with zero slip. What the fuck? And this is about how slow a Mars rover would be traveling. Average speed. I guess, yeah, they'd have to be pretty slow to be energy efficient. It's about 6.7 centimeters per second. That's a nominal speed. They don't All right, there's no air resistance, so you technically could go quickly, but actually not quite because at the same time, you know, gravity is less. Don't go too fast. Actually, does Mars have an atmosphere? No, it doesn't, right? <laughs> I'm going to look it up. <laughs> ah, fuck. I feel so stupid. Hey, pe other people look it up as well. Okay, I'm not that much stupid. 
much thinner. Yeah, no shit people wouldn't be able to breathe. But it still does have one, right? It's just super thin. Okay, good to know. See, I'm not entirely stupid. Fast. Just slightly. Actually, no, not uninformed. Little speed. They don't go too fast. All right, I'm gonna go walk on simulated moon regular. It looks like beach, and it feels like beach. Okay. This side is meant to simulate the surface of the moon, and this side is meant to be the surface of Mars. It is uh, very sinky sand. Right. Really okay. Rolling along, rolling along. Hits a rock, and I'm just. Am I pushing into it, or do I want to get it on top? I'd say get on top and just put all your body weight onto it. That's basically my full weight on it. The sheet memory is alloy so is strong cool. enough to support the weight of a vehicle or vehicle and crew. I bet these are, would be so much more expensive to produce than normal rubber wheels, though. So I don't know how long it's going to be until we see these in, in actual cars and stuff. it's flexible, so it can deform up to 8% without being permanently and also, damaged. And also how, and like, that is, that is crazy it's amounts of bending. Long. But I'm just curious, like... How much of this material would you need to use for to support like a truck or something? You know, something heavy that would go on the road. I really don't see this being super widely used on super widely used on normal cars for like a long time. Or, <laughs> yeah. On space missions. So that's a pretty good amount of deformation, right? That's a great amount of deformation. And still, and it's not perfectly the intact. It's so gooey. That's so Just cool. Walking back to the car after the beach. Tricky for a rover, right? But these tires won't just be for space. They're also looking at terrestrial applications. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. Most aircraft, the tires on those aircraft, they have to be pressurized to really, really high pressurizations. 300, that... 400 PSI. Okay, yeah, that, that... Not that. That sounds fucked up because it's just rubber holding that much pressure. Conventional. 30 to 60 psi you do in a car or, truck. or 100 for a bike truck tire right we have issues where at those huge pressurizations they can explode the other yeah. construct is is i've actually I, I don't know i don't know about you guys but i've actually seen a couple of videos of people uh, going uh, using uh, like track track tires for uh, like track uh, wheels that are that are made to, you know you know how by, like if you're cycling you can go on a like a track which is like the circle thing where you just go go like that my phone just tried to kill itself for a sec uh, i'm back though yeah so the point is those wheels you're supposed to pump them with really high pressure and you're supposed to use them on the track which is like perfectly smooth so you're not you know you're not going to puncture there's nothing to puncture wheels on and I, i've seen videos of people uh, using those on real roads and their whole fucking wheels explode like the pressure is really high in those and that's only like 180 psi right like track truck track bike wheel psi yeah like from 120 to 250 so that like that's already way higher right and so you look at planes which is even above that and it's just rubber being held up and there's that amount of weight to support i could 100 percent see that going wrong right so if i'm a pneumatic tire and i'm relying on that pneumatics for the performance of the system i have to always be checking the air pressure to make sure that i'm at the right inflation pressure yes so that i'm not burning too much fuel or i'm not at a place where I could potentially pop a tire because of the loads. Yeah, and being at the wrong pressure is also super inefficient. Like if the pressure is too too high, it could pop. If it's too low, you'll use you'll be using way way more energy to move the same distance. By going to a structural system that doesn't rely on air and is designed specifically it's just for the rigid. Well, not quite rigid, but you know what I mean. All those things go away. They've tested one on a Jeep. Since it doesn't rely on pressurized air for support, you just can't get a flat tire. Plus, it can never be underinflated, which significantly improves fuel economy. Improves fuel economy, and in general, like, it's one less element for people to fuck up. Removing the, hu removing the human element from things that are, that could potentially be dangerous uh, is super good. With a metal that works like magic, you can make airless tires that will take us off-road, on-road, into the air Fuck yeah. and across other worlds.
insane video as always, man. I've watched a couple other very Tassian videos in my own time, but we've only reacted to one on this channel. And I gotta say, pretty much everything he produces is super good. Like there's NASA's night so informative. Tires are designed to last the entire lifetime of a rover mission, even on the rough terrain of Mars. But here on Earth, few products last a lifetime. From bike tires to phones to toothbrushes, pretty much everything wears out. Yes. But with Henson Shaving, the sponsor of this video, you may never need to buy another razor again in your life. All right, let's Henson see the sponsor segment real quick. of an aerospace machine shop that built parts for the Mars rover and the ISS. So they are experts in precise, high-quality work. If the temperature to manufacture their rover parts changed as little as one degree, they had to scrap the entire piece. And that sort of precision is overlooked by most That's cool. razor manufacturers. In a typical razor, the blades flex and bend when they make contact with the skin. And this movement causes micro cuts leading to skin irritation and razor bumps. To many people, this is just an inevitable part of shaving, but it doesn't need to be. You want advice about a good razor? Trust a guy with a beard. This is Henson's AL13 razor. That looks cool. It's so precise that the blade extends past the shave plane by exactly 0 0.0013 inches. That's less than the width of a human hair. The blade is also securely fastened at exactly 30 degrees, leaving almost zero blade flex for a smoother and cleaner shave. This razor is designed to last a lifetime, and its standard double-edged blades cost only around 10 cents each, which means the cost of ownership for an AL13 razor ends up lower than most cartridge or electric razors. After yeah, that is a thing. Like, razors in general are weirdly expensive. Like, you just have to buy them. You have to buy new ones. You know, cartridge razors, yeah. You know, funnily enough, the razors that are fully replaceable, along with the handle, the ones that you actually dump in the trash, you grab a new one, they turn out cheaper than cartridge razors. It's just a fun fact. I don't, I don't know why it's relevant. Years. But. And besides price considerations, having one razor for the rest of your life is both more convenient and better for the planet. So if you want one aerospace quality razor to last the rest of your life, go to hensonshaving.com slash veritasium. And There's his link. Veritasium for There's his code. Blades with the purchase of a razor. Give it a look, guys. It's two to four years worth of blades on me. Make sure to add both the razor and the blades to your cart for the code to take effect. So I want to thank Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video, and I want to thank you. Thanks for sponsoring watching. his video. And thank me for watching. Thank you guys for watching my reaction to his react to his video, which you've probably already watched if you're watching my reaction to it. But hey, uh, uh, hey that's wrong. The wrong button. Hey, <laughs> who gives a shit about any of that? Guys, just open up my link. Hit up his video. If you haven't watched it already, give it a watch. If you have, leave a like, comment, uh, you know, do the algorithm stuff. And actually, go do that for this video you're watching right now, because it really helps. Uh, you know, we're trying to grow here as a channel, so, you know, do the thing, do the YouTube thing. Come on, come on, come on, just, just do it, dude. come on, it's not that right, it's not that right. All right, uh, that's, that's the YouTube stuff done, self-plugs done. Uh, you can also hit up my main channel, second link in the description if you're curious. And with that said, I'm just, just going to say bye now, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing better, better wheels on, on, on this bad boy a few years down the line, hopefully. All right, bye!